Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to another edition of Notes on Ningyo, week number nine. Um, this has been a fun series, and it's going to continue. Uh, each week, we're taking a little bit of a different slice of Japanese uh, doll history. And this week, we're going to be working with a different uh, kind of doll, uh, Isho Ningyo. And Isho Ningyo are sometimes... Uh, translated or frequently translated as fashion dolls because of the focus on costume. Uh, it's a little bit of a history romp. It's a little bit of a cultural romp. Uh, but more importantly, we are going to be looking at some spectacularly beautiful dolls that were designed uh, and valued and displayed uh, for their aesthetic beauty, uh, particularly their textiles. So it's a very, very fun uh, sort of a focus topic for our series on Ningyo. So let's just get right into it, shall we? So this week on Notes on Ningyo, we have courtesans, actors, and villains, 18th century Japanese fashion dolls. Now, in the doll world, uh, frequently, if you say fashion doll, it's going to be or going to bring to mind something like this, a uh, bisque-headed doll, uh, possibly by Jumo, a uh, French make, maybe German. I don't know. I really don't do much with, with uh, Western fashion dolls. Uh, but it does bring up a fairly specific image of a young girl, uh, mohair wig, uh, rosy cheeks, uh, attired in uh, the fashions of that day, uh, late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, sometimes with a trousseau or accessories, travel kits and that type of thing. Um, and that's all well and good. But when we're dealing with Ishonin, when we're dealing with Japanese fashion dolls, uh, we're looking at something entirely different. Uh, the French and German and Western fashion dolls largely uh, were created for children, albeit, you know, well off children, because, you know, truth be told, these were not cheap things. Um, and they were enjoyed as playthings, maybe carefully played with, but playthings. But when we're dealing with Japanese isho ningyo, we're dealing with more what might be considered an adult commodity. Not so much because of subject matter, although there's a little bit of that too. But they weren't designed to be played with. They were designed largely to be displayed. And so, for example, this is a very famous example of, a, of an isho ningyo from the 18th century that's in the Tokyo National Museum. And it has all the hallmarks that one would look for. It has the carved hair uh, called tomogami uh, in Japanese, um, uh, silk textiles, front tied obi, uh, a beautiful face done uh, in an exquisite white gofun, the coarse starch to shell and animal glue, uh, and then painted details, uh, very subdued, very womanly. Um, Ishoniga were not always women. Uh, the majority are of women, or later on we'll get into that a little bit more about kabuki actors and that type of thing. But uh, every now and then you do find male figures. Again, this is a pairing uh, from the Tokyo National Museum. I borrowed these. Um, and again, uh, representing what might be considered the quintessential thought image of an Ishoningyo, 18th century Ishoningyo, if you're speaking in the Japanese context. So a question comes to mind, well, if they weren't played with, what did one do with them? And so when we look um, at historical records, we know that they were valued. We know that they were avidly collected. Uh, and But then the record goes a little bit silent about actually how they were displayed. So uh, we have to turn to a slightly more modern record uh, for that. And looking at the early 20th century, we find photographic images of Takashi Endo's Unaiso, or Children's Villa. And I, I return to this series of images a lot because, one, the collection of Ningyo was just extraordinary. But two, it gives us a, a little bit of a sense, particularly the non-Japanese viewer, a little bit of sense of how these dolls would have been displayed in the domestic context. And so here you have a Japanese interior with what's called a tokonomo, uh, tokonoma, or, or a sort of a display alcove with a hanging scroll there that would have changed seasonally. And if we just, and we can see this was set up for the Hina Matsuri, so there are a lot of dolls out, maybe more than normal in a Japanese home. But if we skew over there and zoom in on the upper right shelf, uh, Kazaridana or display shelf, uh, we find, you can see in the black and white photographs, uh, the reflection of the, the gold textiles on Anisho Ningyo that is not unlike the one shown in the inset with her Kinan uh, gold uh, brocade textiles that sort of flash there in the light in a sort of an 
animated posture. Uh, turning to another room in the Unai So, uh, we find another tokonoma, uh, this time with a painting of a Bijinga or a painting of a beautiful woman, and we'll get into that in just a little bit because Bijinga and Isho Ningyo of women are very much interrelated in terms of cultural context and who would have appreciated them. So in the tokonoma, you have a massive, oh, uh, Jiro Zaimo, uh, Hina Ningyo set that I would love to find. Uh, but then if we zoom in again on the right, uh, we find uh, a Isho Ningyo of a, a person or a, a woman in sort of a contrapposto or a little animated uh, pose uh, that is not unlike the figure shown in the inset. Again, these are 18th century figures uh, with the tomogami carved hair, uh, the kiran brocade. And in this particular example, she has a fan uh, and her right hand is dancing. So the focus uh, of Isho Ningyo, as the name implies, is textiles. And, and anyone with a passing familiarity with Japanese historical culture will know that textiles have played a seminal role uh, from well, pretty much the very beginning. Uh, and if you look at Heian period court culture and go back to like the diary of Seishonagon that I referred to last week or the tales of Genji, you'll find that a lot of effort and a lot of thought and a lot of importance was invested in the clothing and the attire of the imperial classes, which for the women, in this case, largely consisted of uh, multiple layers of a gown, five layers or 12 layers of a gown of figured silk. Uh, and uh, they were voluminous. Uh, up to 480 yards of textiles was required to create a complete habit, if you will. Um, and in Ningyo world, we find this uh, reflected somewhat uh, well, actually more than somewhat, fairly, fairly accurately in the Hina Ningyo known as Yusoku Bina. We'll get into that in another talk, I'm sure. But as you dial in and zoom in, you can see the layered gown, the figured silk uh, of this uh, May Bina or female figure from a, Jiro, uh, from a uh, Yusoku Bina set. And we'll get more into the aesthetics of her face and that uh, whatnot later. But this gives you a sense of how those imperial costumes translated into Ningyo form. But beginning in the Edo period, which is uh, 1615 to 1868, and a period of time that we spend a lot of our time in because it was literally the golden age of Ningyo, uh, we find that uh, those multi-layered costumes and 480 yards of silk, uh, one, aside from being expensive to, to make, uh, were completely inappropriate or impractical in terms of uh, an aggressive or an active lifestyle. And so in the uh, below the imperial classes and the samurai nobility and then going down to merchant classes and on down, you found the development and the efflorescence, if you will, of a different type of kimono uh, called a kosode. Now, kosode uh, literally means narrow sleeve, but it's not the length of the sleeve per se, and this is a little bit tricky, but the sleeve opening, it's a wrist opening that's quite narrow. Sometimes the sleeves are long and they're called furisole, uh, but uh, they're all a kosode style with a narrow wrist, wrist excuse me. But um, with a kimono, kimono literally just means hanging thing, a fairly fixed structure. Uh, design was not so much in the cut, uh, but was in the surface design and the creative interplay of surface design over a fairly static shape. So um, this is a kosode, a beautiful kosode from the Edo period, showing just how wonderful and vibrant the design patterning can be. So in the uh, sort of the overlapping of textile culture and the visual arts, uh, you started having in the late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, hinagatabon, or these books that uh, profiled kimono patterns. And this was so that people could know what were uh, new fashions, if you will, coming out. But to help illustrate, not only would they have a static rendition of the garment itself and its design, but then typ typically there would also be an illustration of a woman wearing a kimono. Not necessarily the same kimono, but a, a kimono. And so that gave it a, a, a stronger visual appeal, a visual buy-in for the, for the viewer. And these became actually collected not only for the kimono pattern, but also for the illustrations of beautiful women known as Bijinga. And so Bijinga as an illustration evolved from literally a, a manual on kimono pattern into wonderful paintings, uh, an entire subgenre of art 
Beijing Da. Uh, and so here you have a, a, a courtesan uh, playing with a dog, uh, and you have her kosude kimono, which is partially covered by another garment called a nuchigake. Now, a nuchigake is an outer garment, and I know these Japanese terms can get a little heady sometimes, but the kimono uh, and the uchigake are going to be um, elements, design elements, clothing elements, attire elements that we're going to be looking at a lot today uh, as we go through the Isho Ningyo that I'm going to profile. And so those two terms, Uchigake, outer kimono, and kimono, the inner uh, garment, uh, are something that you want to really sort of bear in mind because I'll be using those terms very, very liberally. But the Ijinga, uh, as it was interpreted in Ningyo form frequently, uh, was uh, like this. So these were known as Bijin Ningyo, uh, or Isho Ningyo, uh, or sometimes Ukyo Ningyo, or floating world dolls. And we'll get into that in a little bit, why they were called Ukyo Ningyo. And Ukyo Ningyo in, in English is usually translated as a genre doll. But here's a beautiful example of an 18th century uh, Isho Ningyo, or Bijin Ningyo, or Ukyo Ningyo, with her Uchigake outer garment. And you can just see the red of her inner kimono, which is in a checker pattern. Uh, possibly a late 18th century because her hair here is actually a uh, real hair as opposed to the carved tomogami. But the textiles themselves, when we're looking at the evolution of Ningyo textile history, uh, frequently uh, it wasn't until the 19th century that you start having kimono literally made and designed for dolls, sort of a scale issue where uh, supplemental embroidery designs and uh, some of the figured patterning was literally done for the doll. Uh, and so, for example, in this sort of first half of the 19th century kimono for another uh, type of doll known as a mitsure, a triple jointed, you can see that this clearly, this entire kimono ensemble was designed specifically for the doll in terms of scale, woven specifically for. And that was something that would come a little bit later in evolution uh, of the Isho Ningyo form. And so, but as a rule, when we're looking at Isho Ningyo, uh, dolls of women, frequently courtesans, and we'll get into that in a little bit, we find what's known as a komo, or a smaller pattern. And these smaller patterns would have been selected uh, for scale appropriateness, but the textile itself might have been designed as a surround for a hanging scroll. It might have been designed in connection with a, a Buddhist garment. Uh, it might have been uh, designed in connection with um, uh, surrounds for folding screens, which was a huge industry. And so uh, Ningyo artists in Tokyo, or I'm sorry, in Kyoto specifically, had great access to phenomenal textiles, um, vivid designs of dragons and clouds and other auspicious motifs that work very, very well for uchigake, like here, or inner kimono even. Uh, but they were not woven specifically for the doll. They would have just been appropriately sized textiles called komo, or small pattern textiles. Um, but as we move along, we start finding supplemental embroidery that would have been done specifically uh, to enhance the doll. So this is the backside of that doll uh, showing the supplemental embroidery that would have been added uh, on the hem of her inner kimono. And you can see the small wrist openings there. But when we're focusing on 18th century Isho Ningyo, largely we're going to be looking at Kinran. Kinran or Ginran. Kinran is a gold lamellae. And so it's the, the supplemental uh, paper back gold threads that are woven in as part of the brocade. And these usually form the pattern. Uh, typically, uh, the silk, uh, uh, the solid silk is, is the majority with the gold uh, kinran being the design. But every now and then you find the reverse where the kinran is actually the surface of the textile with the inner design being in the, in the silk. Uh, threads themselves. And so uh, sometimes you find these spectacularly gold and orbed, golden haloed Isho Ningyo, where the gold lamellae just sort of shines and is brilliant just because of the sheer ratio. Uh, but also our Nishiki brocades, also a Kyoto especially, were very well suited uh, to uh, Isho Ningyo. And so here we have a, uh, an Isho Ningyo, a Bijin, uh, with her Uchigake with the sleeves uh, thrown back off of her proper right arm, revealing the inner kimono, uh, and then the uchigake being secured at the waist to keep it from sliding down. And if you look at the back view, you can see, oh, the sumptuousness of that 
uh, brocade textile with the gold sort of flashing there in the light uh, and how the sleeve has been thrown back. And that's a that's an affectation uh, to allow freedom of movement. Uh, it was uh, seen as sort of icky or chic. Uh, and this was a very common uh, element that you find uh, in Biji Ningyo, particularly of the 18th century. Here's another a wonderful, luscious example of an 18th century Biji Ningyo. Again, we know it's a courtesan because the obi is tied in the front. Uh, and that was sort of an affectation or a style um, conceit of the... Uh, Courtesan, because as I like to say, well, easy access, front tie, you know, there you go. Um, but if you look at the back, you can also see that her uh, proper left sleeve has been thrown back. And again, uh, the wonderful layering of the textiles and the kinron poking out. Um, and so the study of textiles is important when you're looking at a beijing and the different fabrics and the different weaves that all came into play. And so here uh, we also have another courtesan because the obi is tied in the front, but the, the entire obi is done uh, in a black birodo or velvet very expensive fabric at the time, uh, rare because of the iron mortar frequently led to its deterioration. But you can see on the sleeve on her properly, there's your kosode, the narrow wrist opening and the flash of the Kinran design there of a dragon. Uh, so very stylistically or stylized or stylishly dressed uh, Isho Bijin there with her uchigake uh, and her black birodo obi and the, uh, and, and the kimono underneath. So hairstyles uh, are uh, well, sort of one of the areas that one needs to get involved in a little bit because there was so much emphasis placed on arrangement of hair historically. Uh, they were used as class demarcations. They were used as occupational demarcations. They were used as age demarcations. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, many manuals have been published on hairstyles over the ages and helping identify what they mean, what they symbolize, and even small uh, mock-ups or small ningyo, because ningyo literally also means a small thing. So ningyo of just the hair wigs themselves or the mage, the hairstyle, the mage, uh, were uh, popular and, and done uh, to sort of help showcase various styles. And if one really wanted to get into it, you can do what I call an anatomy of a mage, uh, the various folds and what they symbolized and what their terminology was. And so if someone wants to go on a deep dig into mage, you can freeze frame this and take notes about the various elements that go into a mage. But I won't break that down here for uh, time considerations. But as we go through and look at our Biji Ningyo of the 18th century, we find very accurate reflection of actual hairstyle. So Yatsuko Shimada is one hairstyle shown very dramatically here on this uh, 18th century Biji Ningyo or Isho Ningyo uh, with her Tomogami carved wood hair, uh, Yatsuko Shimada uh, style. Uh, another popular style is the Kushimage or using combs, a uh, liberal use of combs to help secure and anchor uh, the, the mage. So kushimage, well illustrated here. Uh, and a nage shimada, or a falling or a nage uh, shimada uh, hairstyle. Uh, very, very popular. And you find many, many um, variations on this particular mage. And there you have the uh, mock tortoiseshell comb uh, in her hair. And again, we know that this is uh, a courtesan because of our front tied obi. And again, her uchigake is kind of casually thrown back on the, revealing the shoulders and the inner kimono there. Uh, once we start moving into the elaborate world of the uh, courtesan hairstyle, uh, names escape and it just becomes this phantasmagoric uh, uh, phantas phantasma of, of hair and pins and ties and elements that uh, just uh, are so uh, uh, evocative of that profession, of that aesthetic, uh, and are so well interpreted uh, in ningyo form. Frequently, a little bit later when they're working with the real hair, formed uh, the real hair as opposed to the carved hair, you find some of this very accurately rendered. So in terms of beauty, when we're looking at Isho Ningyo, we're all, it's all about a study of beauty. Uh, and there are a few things that uh, are the hallmarks, uh, Japanese-specific hallmarks of beauty that may cause the non-Japanese Western observer to scratch their head and say, what is going on? Uh, part of it had to deal with the white, the white faces and the application of white makeup that was actually made out of a mercury chloride, if you believe it, uh, to create 
this sense of whiteness. Whiteness meaning that there was no need for labor. It was symbolic of the, the, the leisure and the noble classes inside all the time. Uh, never seeing the light of day to, to darken the skin. And so to augment that uh, effect, they would use a mercury chloride makeup to make their faces even whiter. And in Mingyo, the Gofun has this white brilliance to it, which is a, a wonderful reflection of that particular uh, aspect of, of the aesthetics of beauty. Uh, but uh, again, we're going to deal with this image just for a couple of seconds because all the elements that I'm going to talk about are shown here. So we have the white face and then observers will go, what are those two smudges on the top of her head? And those are known as okimayu. Uh, and okimayu uh, are uh, or sky brows and these were beauty marks. And so in the imperial classes, they would shave their regular eyebrows and then place these two smudges uh, at the top of their heads, uh, and that was done out of a uh, out of a, a uh, actually it's a ink made out of a rice fungus or black fungus that grew on rice. You know they get kind of crazy with this makeup stuff. Uh, what price to pay for beauty? Uh, and then they would uh, have their white makeup, and then they would do these upper smudges, sky brows, and this is very much a sign of the imperial class. Uh, and so ningyo uh, with that frequently indicate some sort of aristocratic. Uh, component to the doll. Uh, and then uh, the uh, two more elements in this particular face. I love this face and I, I use it a lot because it just it brings it all together. You'll notice that she actually has black teeth. We'll get into that in a minute. And also a lower green lip. So white skin, okimayu sky brows, ohaguro black teeth, and the green lower lip. Uh, these are signs of beauty that we're going to focus on right now in a few examples. So again, when we look at the Hina Ningyo, which by definition uh, depict a uh, lord and lady from the imperial court, you'll notice that they have an Okimayu sky brow. This is done in a very stylized, almost a very light handed way here uh, in this early, early uh, 18th century um, uh, Hina form. So, so beautiful, uh, but very act reflective of that. The ohaguro, or the blackened teeth, um, can be kind of uh, off-putting at first. You think uh, in the West, you think of black teeth as maybe being rotted, but actually it was a sign of beauty, and it was actually a combination of tannic and ferric acid that actually helped preserve the teeth. It was actually healthy for the teeth. And you would have teeth blackening jars and brushes, and it would be part of a of a woman's uh, toilet toilet. Uh, and she would apply this, and this was particularly common in the brothel districts and things like that, but also in the imperial classes. And so the blackened teeth was very much a sign of beauty. And so when we look in Camus our Ningyo, frequently we find black teeth on not only the Hina Ningyo, but also on our Biji Ningyo, our Isho Ningyo. And so here you can see uh, the blackened teeth and also the lower green lip, uh, which I'll uh, get into now. So Another figure that I enjoy very much is this uh, lovely lady with her blackened teeth and her just the accent of the, the lower green lip. Now, the lower green lip is a little bit of a perplexing thing, and that is because there is a, a red dye in Japan that's used for textiles and many things called a, a beni or a safflower. And the highest quality beni would have a slight undertone of green. So a flash of green indicated the highest quality of the Benny safflower. So to sort of so show off a luxurious or to say that this is the highest quality, they would accentuate the green element and little by little, forget the Benny, just go Benny, just go straight for green. So it became symbolic of beauty, symbolic of wealth, symbolic of an elite form, an elite aesthetic among women. Uh, and this is, oh, beautifully captured uh, in a novel uh, or in a sort of a diary observation book called The Praise of Shadows by Junichiro Tanizaki. Uh, and you'll fam be familiar with him because of his books, The Marioka Sisters or Diary of a Mad Old Man. And he was a, a brilliant writer and, and many of his translations are, are very popular in the West, but in Japan, he's, he's iconic as a novelist. And in Praise of Shadows, which he did in 1933, he wrote, and, and Praise of Shadows has to deal with light and the, fa the, the quality of light and darkness within Japanese culture and aesthetics. Uh, but to our point uh, in, in Praise of Shadows, he says, What fascinates me most of all, however, is that green, iridescent lipstick, so rarely used today even by Kyoto Geisha. One can guess nothing of its power unless one imagines it in the low, unsteady light of a candle. The woman of old was made to hide the red of her mouth under green-black lipstick, 
to put shimmering uh, ornaments in her hair. And so the last trace of color was taken from her rich skin. I know of nothing whiter than the face of a young girl in the wavering shadow of a lantern, her teeth now and then as she smiles, shining a lacquered black through lips like elfin fires. Holy smokes, elfin fires, people. I love that line. And it very much captures this sense, elfin fire, the green of the lip, uh, seen in candlelight as accentuating uh, the also the blackness of the teeth, but also the whiteness of the skin. So very much all tying into the Japanese aesthetics. And we find that played out over and over and over again in Isho Ningyo. And here's another beautiful Isho Ningyo of a courtesan with her, her uh, very uh, elaborate coiffure and her mage with the combs and her front tied obi with the dragon pattern, her green lip, black teeth, uh, narrow eyes. Just absolutely wonderful, wonderful figure. But curiously, as we canvas Ningyo forms, we find the green lips showing up on things that really aren't known for uh, trying to focus on beauty, like Anesama Ningyo or older sister dolls were companion dolls, play simple play dolls, and they frequently are found with green lower lip. And then quite unexpectedly, the Gosho Ningyo or palace doll that we focused on before, largely male figures, sometimes even on Gosho Ningyo, we find a green lower lip. So here's a classic Gosho face with a Mizuhiki uh, presentation ribbon on the head that I discussed last week. But then he's got a green lower lip. What's going on with that? But anyway, so sometimes these affectations become divorced from their original context and are just simply used. Now, frequently, I've uh, already mentioned that we're dealing, uh, many of the Isho Ningyo deal with courtesans, and that might be surprising that there was such a, uh, a robust doll trade in hookers, uh, but that's just part of the cultural influence that courtesans had during the Edo period. So here's a painting uh, that shows uh, some of the layers of uh, the courtesan world, if you will. So in the background, you find a caged-like element called a, a harimise. And the lower classes of yujo, or prostitutes, would have to spend part of each day in the harimise so that passers-by could look, they could engage in convers conversation, start up a little bit of a, a connection, if you will. And then the client could go inside, make arrangements, and, 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 oh, and there we go. Uh, other courtesans, the higher ranked courtesans, which were the most elusive, were either called oiran or taiyu. And at any given point in time, there were very few of the high ranking uh, taiyu or oiran uh, working. Uh, it took a very rare and special combination of gifts, both physical and intellectual and talent wise, for a young girl to make her rise through the ranks to become a Taiyu, but they became sort of the ultimate quest and the paragons of beauty within the ukyo or floating world that I mentioned uh, earlier. And so paintings of Oiran and Taiyu uh, were uh, pretty much the go-to for Bijinga because that was the most elusive beauty. Very few people would ever, ever, ever dream of being able to afford uh, spending time with a Taiyu, much less going through the elaborate process it took in order to reach her. Um, and frequently, I need to include this wonderful painting of a set of, of uh, yujo or uh, prostitutes or courtesans in their harimise, passing their time. And the one in the middle there, possibly the highest ranking of the group thus far, is playing with a beautiful doll. And I just, I can never uh, slide by a a harimise discussion without uh, bringing this uh, wonderful uh, 18th century painting uh, to bear and show the uh, uh, courtesan playing with the doll and here the doll is being dressed. But Isho Ningyo depicting uh, the Taiyu or the Oiran were pretty much the stuff and the stock of uh, Ukyo Ningyo and, and Isho Ningyo of women. And so here's a fantastic uh, tableau set of three, part of a uh, set of three tableau uh, that uh, belong to uh, the Hannig collection that I profiled uh, at last year's uh, UFTC convention in Nashville, uh, but worth venturing into again. Uh, so here we have a very elegant willowy uh, oiran with her front tied obi. You can see her black lacquered clogs poking out, uh, geta, uh, poking out from underneath her inner innermost red kimono. Uh, and again, as we zoom in on the face here, we find that 
uh, the comb, uh, use of combs in her mage again, and uh, how her uchigake is kind of thrown off the shoulder to reveal the patterning of her of her uh, kinran uh, inner red kimono and the layers of white and blue. And when you really dissect this doll, she's got a lot of layers going on. And uh, when we look at her back, you can see the folds and uh, some of the inner layers showing off there. But again, she's got that left sleeve kind of thrown back casually. And there you find the dragon rondelle peeked out in, in uh, Kinran. Uh, and then again, that kosode narrow sleeve opening for her uchigake. But the back, I just, I love the, the narrowness and the willowiness of the wisp. Now, in looking at Japanese textile patterns, frequently people get a little bit shocked because they see a swastika and they automatically the negative connotations of the swastika come to mind. But one must suspend that sort of reference uh, and look at the swastika or the manji, uh, as is known in Japanese, uh, within the context of originally a Buddhist symbol, incredibly auspicious. And you have different directions, uh, ura manji and the omote manji, each having different connotations of strength and intelligence and that type of thing. And so you'll find these patterns woven into the textiles, uh, but it's very much auspicious Buddhist reference as opposed to anything having to do with, with the swastika in the Western tradition. But the courtesan, the high-ranking courtesans were known for their processions. Uh, they would travel through the various brothel districts uh, in Edo, uh, or Kyoto or Osaka, they were rarely behind the Harimise uh, cage. And so they would make their uh, presence known and their reputation known by doing these elaborate parades uh, through uh, the pleasure districts for fans to ogle their kimono, uh, the willowiness of their walk, the, the very elegant uh, hachimonji, the, 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 eight fig the figure eight walk that was so complex that they would execute on these high geta. Uh, and so uh, Taiyu, uh, Oiran, more the stuff of legend, but they were also real individuals. And a number have come down to us in history as fa being fairly well documented. And even lineages of Taiyu would form. Uh, and so one of the most famous is the uh, Takao of the house Miura. And so Takao had, uh, I think there was like uh, 12 different Takao, um, but all um, uh, representing this highest rank. And Takao, specifically Takao II, the second Takao, um, which... She uh, had, um, she died at the age of 19, uh, straddled uh, the early part of the um, um, late 1600s, early 1700s. Many paintings were done of Takao too, and Takao, uh, and so this is a, a very uh, interesting or lovely uh, Masanobu a painting of Takao entertaining an actor, uh, and that confluence of the acting world with the courtesan world uh, was pretty much the quintessence of ukyo or the floating world that we'll get into in just a little bit more. Uh, but Takao uh, was uh, very celebrated and uh, any number of bijinga were made depicting specifically Takao and identified as such. But every now and then we find ningyo and this particular ningyo has its box that indicates that this is also a ningyo of Takao. Uh, and so Taco's story is worth delving into just a little bit here, uh, because not only was she a courtesan, but th there's so many, her, her beauty was so celebrated and her life so tragically short, dying at 19, uh, that stories were made about her beauty. Stories were made about her death and translated into a kabuki uh, stage, which frequently took uh, great liberties uh, with the whole story. And it is true that Takao uh, had, um, uh, Takao too specifically, had uh, uh, an encounter or a relationship with a, a feudal lord, a young feudal lord, a date uh, Tsunanume, uh, sorry, Tsunamune, uh, who was a young daimyo of the Mutsu uh, area. And so he had been involved in a, a sort of a succession uh, struggle. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of backstage politics. And so his love affair or his relationship with Takao, we don't really know what her feelings were, and this young lord um, sort of evolved into a kabuki drama of, of appropriately dramatic uh, contours. And so when uh, the uh, lord wanted to, or the young samurai nobleman wanted to buy Takao out of her contract, the owners of House Miura um, said that they would, you know, it would be her weight in gold. And so they put her on a scale 
and he was supposed to pay her weight in gold. However, they also put lead bars within the folds of her kimono to accentuate that weight and up the price. And so there's here on the left is a woodblock print showing Takao being uh, weighed for her weight in gold. And she is, in point of fact, purchased out of her contract. And one of the stories is, is that on her way back up a uh, river with the young lord f just purchased uh, in despondency, she tries to fling herself into the river. Uh, and he is so angry that he actually pulls her back in and then stabs her to death, uh, ending uh, the relationship. And that was a very uh, short term purchase uh, to be a little bit cavalier about that. But in point of fact, that is all stuff of Kabuki theater. And it is uh, thought that she died of uh, tuberculosis or some sort of uh, illness uh, rather than a knife to the heart by an un, un, un unhappy customer, if you will. But the Ningyo of Takao here shows a vibrant red Uchigaki outer kimono, a black birodo uh, obi front tied with uh, shishi, a lion dog there, and chrysanthemums, and that's a whole other story. But when we peel back, uh, the layer we find this amazing uh, gold, uh, silver thread uh, embroidered bird, long tailed bird on, on the back of her kimono. Overall, uh, just a, a beautiful, beautiful rendition. But this idea of the courtesan and her lover, uh, sometimes uh, a willing lover, sometimes uh, the courtesan was a willing lover, sometimes not so much. But that relationship uh, was very much the stuff of reality, but also kabuki drama and play. And so I want to turn to Another tableau, winding this up a little bit, uh, of another tableau of, of uh, Anisho Ningyo showing a female uh, courtesan uh, and a male. And so at first it looks like it's two lovers uh, in it sort of whispering a tryst. But when we look at the box, we actually find out that this is uh, two very famous figures drawn from both historical reality and a little bit of nuanced kabuki drama uh, relating to the 1702 incident known as the or uh, event called the Akko incident, or in English, it's frequently referred to as the tale of the 47 Ronin, uh, Masterless Samurai. And I won't go into the entire story now because, well, it's an entire story, but it has to deal with a vendetta of 49 samurai who were revenging the unjust uh, death of their lord and that they waited 21 months to enact this revenge on the perpetrator. Uh, it has became the stuff of legends because after they raided the castle shown here uh, in uh, a woodblock print, uh, they killed the offender, decapitated him, took his head uh, to and offered it as a temple to show that they had uh, avenged their lord and then they surrendered themselves to authorities. And so that very real historical event that took place in 1702 frequently became or quickly became uh, the attempted stuff of drama. The Kabuki theater playwrights attempted to get right on it. Uh, soon after 1703, they attempted productions, but because of the political overtones, because vendettas were, well, illegal, uh, the government didn't want to promote such hooliganism. Uh, and so there was no play allowed, no real treatment of that allowed in popular culture. Uh, and it took a number of years, not until 1748, that we have a full-fledged uh, rendering, theatrical rendering, of this historic event uh, in actually not Kabuki stage, but in puppet theater in Bunraku, or what is known as Ningyo Joruri. And that was uh, the tale called the Kanade Hon Chushingura, or the Treasury of Loyal Retainers. And that was done in 1748. Uh, and so, uh, wow, okay. Can't go into this in detail because it's it's an amazing look it up read it it's a, a an incredibly read incredibly good read lots of interesting plot twists and things like that but in this we have to focus in on uh, scene seven or uh, that is the number one popular element and there we find our two heroes uh, Yuranosuke who was one of the Ronin who masterminded this this elaborate plot to revenge the master who has been. Uh, ha uh, uh, engaging in a seeming life, a uh, dissolute life, frequenting the brothels of the Guillon and trying to throw uh, the, his observers off the track to say that he's just thrown away his samurai cord, uh, uh, code. And there uh, he is familiar with a courtesan by the name of Okaru. Uh, and Okaru is actually quite the heroine. She voluntarily so, so had her father sell her into uh, uh, the Yoshiwara to become, I mean, I'm sorry, into the Gyon to become a courtesan in order to help fund uh, this vendetta project, if you will. Um, and so in the in scene seven, if you will, there's this climactic reveal uh, where a letter speaking of 
uh, the revenge plot that's about to be enacted is discovered by not only Okaru, uh, thus blowing Yuranosuke's cover that he's actually going to commit uh, this revenge murder, but also leaking beneath the floorboards of the Ichiriki tea house there in the Gion is the villain uh, who now also sees the letter and knows what's afoot. Uh, and so in a very complex maneuver uh, in which Okaru's life is threatened multiple times uh, by her brother and by Yunanosuke, uh, and uh, revenge is taken on uh, by stabbing through the floorboards, uh, the, the villain waiting in, in, in wait. Whoa, you get a sense that this is quite the thing. But this scene of a doll, too, appears to be whispering sweet nothings. It's actually this scene where Yunanosuke and Okaru are discussing the contents of, of the letter. And Okaru, uh, shown here in isolation, uh, beautiful as uh, Nisho Ningyo with her green uh, uchigake uh, done with, a, again, the gold lamele and again, the dragon pattern, her red under kimono and the blue uh, kinran of her obi poking up underneath and you find the comb in her mage. Uh, absolutely uh, just the quintessence of uh, of a beautiful Isho Ningyo from the 18th century. And there uh, you find uh, Yuranosuke sort of leaning over. And if you notice, his finger is pointing up. And that is a direct reference to the scene because Okaru was able to read the letter by using her mirror uh, and reflected light to read the letter from up on the balcony. And so when Yuranosuke points upward, he's actually referencing the balcony and the letter. So, so just a wonderful, wonderful coming together of things. Okay, so moving right along. So not all Isho Ningyo were women, as we just saw with Yuranosuke. Um, and frequently the actor element, uh, various uh, subjects of, 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 of kabuki plays, uh, even puppet theater, would have been singled out uh, because of the bravado of the character or the celebrity of the actor himself, uh, and Ningyo would be made. And so here's a wonderful print showing a number of actors in various roles, both male and female, because you have to remember that in Kabuki theater, all roles, male and female, were performed by men. And so uh, certain men uh, specialized in female roles called onagata, and we'll get into that a lot more in next week's topic. Um, but uh, they, they were the um, movie stars of their day. Woodblock prints served as ways to forward their careers, uh, advertise roles, uh, an entire genre of actor prints evolved uh, that was a mainstay, one of the mainstays of the ukiyo-e, or the, the paintings from the floating world uh, market. But you also find amazing ishoningyo of, of, uh, a warrior, uh, of, of figures drawn from kabuki. Uh, and this is, uh, again, you have the kumadori makeup uh, and uh, those long swords that were such a stock and trade of kabuki. And there with his tall gait. And this is the figure of Asahina. Asahina uh, won't go into that whole drama, but Asahina a stock character. And we know this because the base, the bottom of the base, has this inscription, which lets us know that this is a doll of Asahina uh, and that it's been uh, in the family keeping for, for many, many years. Um, so actor dolls, dolls depicting actors, became a subgenre uh, and also moving from a different type of form, Isho or static, the Kimono are typically t tacked on or not to be removed. Called uh, uh, so they were not uh, designed to be played with. But actor dolls evolved also into play dolls with costumes that you could change for various roles, hairstyles you can change with various roles, and as a consequence, uh, joinery and that type of thing had to evolve uh, to allow for all of this. And this is sort of a, a leading. A sort of hint at next week's topic when we're going to focus on one actor in particular, uh, Sanagawa Ichimatsu. And so uh, your ears might perk up at the term Ichimatsu because yes, that's the very same term that we apply to the doll Ichimatsu, but had origins in the 18th century acting lineage of uh, Sanagawa Ichimatsu. And that's a woodblock print showing him in a male role with his crest there uh, highlighted in the upper right. Wow, okay. Way over time, but that's that was a good romp. I'm happy I did that. Uh, and so, again, a lot of these elements have been discussed in my books uh, and that, that are available online through Amazon or by contacting me directly. Um, but also, as I said, this talk had uh, was part of a presentation or a special exhibit I did at the UFDC, United Federation of Doll Clubs, convention last year in Nashville. And I did a, an extended handout. It's about 50 pages long, and I still have a few copies. 
Uh, and if you want to go in deep, uh, this is uh, elaborately printed. Uh, I mean, it's high quality, four color, uh, about 50 pages that go into depth into these stories and a few more. And if you want, I uh, have a few copies left and you can contact me uh, and they sell for $45 each and you can contact me uh, through my website. But again, uh, this has been Notes on Ningyo Week 9. I'm Alan Scott Payton. So I hope next week you'll turn in for sort of a continuation, but really getting down to uh, Ichimatsu. So Actors and Playthings, The Birth of Ichimatsu Ningyo. And that will be week 10. That will be my 10th installment on Notes on Ningyo. In the meantime, I'm Alan Scott Payton. And I look forward to interacting with you uh, through email on my Facebook page. And now we are also having all of these videos uh, put on YouTube. So you can turn into my YouTube channel as well. But please stay tuned for next week, next Friday, when I'll have this video, Actors and Playthings, The Birth of Ichimatsu Ningyo. Uh, and that should be a very, very fun ride as well. So thank you so much uh, for listening. And everyone stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.